This video is about my journey finding out that I have sleep apnea and I never even knew it or knew that I could possibly have it. I'm going to tell you how it all began, how I realized that I might have sleep apnea, um, how I did it, the steps that I took to get diagnosed, the amazing things that I found out about sleep along the way, and why I'm suspicious that this is actually a problem affecting a lot more people than do get diagnosed with sleep apnea. And I'm going to tell you how I came to understand that sleep apnea is affecting my health and most importantly, what you can do about it. This is a video in my tongue tied series where I'm making weekly vlogs to document my journey of going through getting my tongue tie released and doing orofacial myofunctional therapy. This is week five. If you have no idea what that is, it actually doesn't really matter for this video. Um, you can still watch this video, but if you think that, that the tongue tie might be connected to sleep apnea for you, I highly recommend going back and watching video one where I start to explain the basics of this. Now, I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice. And I am only sharing this because I think it's really important that we hear other people's stories and that those stories can help us fill in the gaps where the medical um, associations are kind of not necessarily going into your house and saying, hey, look, these this might be connected to you having sleep apnea. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of digging and a little bit of research in order to get the most out of the medical system. You can use this as a stepping stone in your research. Feel free to leave comments and I'll reply to them. Also, you can subscribe to this channel and you can like this video to help it reach more people. And you can follow along with my journey when I release a new video every single week. So without further ado, let's talk about sleep apnea. So how it all began for me actually goes all the way back into my childhood. When I was a kid, my dad snored, like snored. <laughs> we would stay in a motel sometimes and motels are by the highway and there's like trucks going along the highway that are shifting gears that make these noises like <laughs> and sometimes my mom and my brother and I would be laying there awake you know, from noise, ambient noise. And we couldn't tell, are we hearing dad or are we hearing trucks on the highway shifting gears? <laughs> it was that bad. Um, sometimes we would go camping and we would stay in a trailer and my dad snoring would shake the trailer, which is really rattly. It has all these like cabinets and like doors and like little metal things that like rattle. So it would kind of sound like a little thunderstorm was happening in the middle of the night and my brother and I would be laying there like awake and like looking at each other like are we ever going to get to sleep um and it you know it would go in waves my dad's snoring so sometimes it would like kind of subside and then it would be quiet for a while and hopefully we would get to sleep before the next kind of storm hit so that was normalized to me it was never talked about as like you know, there's something wrong with that. It was just, that's how dad sleeps. Um, totally normal. And it wasn't until I was about 12 years old that my dad actually did a sleep study and got diagnosed with sleep apnea. And he got a CPAP machine, which are machines that um, strap onto your face. And they have a little like box that plugs into the wall and um, is sending oxygenated air into your airway all night because what sleep apnea is is basically you stop breathing and there's different kinds of sleep apnea there's different ways that you can stop breathing you can stop breathing because your brain stops telling your body to take a breath you can stop breathing because there's a physical obstruction in your airway but when he did the sleep study he told me about it and he told me about going into this place, this clinic in the evening, and there's beds, and they strap you up to these machines, and they 
take a picture basically of you while you're sleeping. I mean, they take thousands of pictures, they record you while you're sleeping and they take that data and they analyze it and then they say you have sleep apnea or you don't have sleep apnea. And I was so fascinated by this when I was a kid. I remember thinking to myself, I want to go. I want somebody to pay it to like look at me while I'm sleeping. People did call me a hypochondriac when I was a kid, but I just, it sounded like fun to me. It sounded like, oh my God, like somebody will do like biofeedback on me. Like how cool is that? Um, and I remember trying on his CPAP machine, which did not fit my face at all, but I like held it and like squeezed it to my face. And just, I remember that feeling of the forced air and like not having to breathe anymore because there was a machine doing it for me. It was so exciting for me when I was a kid. I was like really interested in it. And you know, now that it's been many years since then, um, like, okay, how old am I? <laughs> it's been like 15 years since then, almost 20 years. Um, I know how, what's the right word? Annoying those machines can be because they need to be plugged in. So my dad used to camp a lot and now anytime he camps, he has to have some kind of way to plug his machine in. Um, and he's had to figure out ways that that can work because if he doesn't have that machine, he doesn't sleep well. When we, we grew up near a park and my dad would always comment about how, like, how can these people run in, at six in the morning? Like, where do they get the energy? And the first day that he slept with the sleep machine, um, he woke up and went for a run. He was like, I had all this energy and I didn't know what to do with it. It was like I had a new dad. It, it was a completely different person that the, the dad without the sleep machine, the CPAP, and the dad with the CPAP. So my dad before he got diagnosed and my dad after he got diagnosed. Um, and my dad exhibited other symptoms that nobody, I think, ever connected to sleep apnea. But when you're not sleeping for 30 years, you're not breathing in your sleep for 30 years, it takes a toll on mental health. It takes a toll on um, concentration, ability to focus. It takes a toll in so many ways on the body, mind, and spirit. And I'm just now like putting all those pieces together as I am unraveling my own health journey and I'm learning, wow, these things are all connected for me. Um, so for me, how I got onto this journey with, with sleep apnea is that I got diagnosed with a tongue tie. And tongue tie is simply like your tongue lacks mobility and it's lacks being in the right placement and it affects your breathing, your mouth posture. Um, it can affect your jaw, your development of your mouth, your muscles in your face and neck and shoulders and tension. Um, and it can lead to things like sleep apnea and having obstructions in your airway while you're sleeping. So you're not actually getting proper sleep. So you're feeling tired all the time and you're not able to concentrate. There's even correlations between tongue tie and ADHD, especially in children. And I'm realizing that, you know, basically it's all like a spectrum of how long have you been making these compensations with not having proper tongue posture, not having proper breathing, not having proper sleep for it to develop into a condition where you actually get diagnosed with sleep apnea. And apparently at 29, um, I have progressed that far. And I would say that I am a very mild case. I never thought that I had issues sleeping before this year. Um, so that's a little bit about my journey and how it began and how I got to this place of getting a sleep study and realizing that it could be a really important piece for my health. I think that watching my dad was a huge motivator because when I found out about the tongue tie and I found out that it could be correlated to different airway issues, different breathing issues, different sleep issues, different concentration issues, it, the picture clicked for me. I knew what that looked like. I knew what it looked like to be a man, you know, in past middle age, dealing with these symptoms that he's probably had since he was a kid. 
And I knew how debilitating in certain ways that was. And, um, you know, what a life is when you, you have sleep apnea and you have a CPAP machine and what that kind of creates having a machine attached to you while you sleep every single night. So when I realized that I could do orofacial myofunctional therapy to address the issues in my airway, address the issues in my breathing, um, it was like a no brainer for me when I knew that I could get the tongue tie release, which is a surgery to physically cut the tongue and allow it to like return to posture. Um, a no brainer for me that, you know, I wanted to do what I could to avoid having TMJ grinding, teeth grinding at night, sleep apnea, you know, all the different things that I had seen people struggle with. So that's, that's my journey of how that all began. And the steps that I took to actually get diagnosed was pretty simple. The, the big part was like putting it together in my head and making it a priority and, and being motivated to like go through the steps of, so I, I talked to my primary care provider and I said, I would like a sleep study. And, um, she said, do you snore? And I said, not really. And she said, do you sometimes snore? And I said, yeah. And she said, okay. Cause basically with a referral, there needs to be some kind of reason. But once you get that referral, um, I got a call from a sleep center where I live to schedule an assessment. And I went in and I filled out their forms, which were like, basically, do you nap all the time? Do you fall asleep in the car? Do you fall asleep when you read? Do you fall asleep? Ba -da -da. Do you fall asleep? Do you fall asleep? Do you fall asleep? And I'm like, oh my God. Because I am the friend in my friend group that's like the notorious napper. Like I will nap for four hours in the middle of the afternoon. No problem. Six hours even. Like I will nap a lot. I will fall asleep in the car. I fall, I've fallen asleep in the car since I was a kid. So I'm filling out the form and it's just all clicking to me. I don't know if you've, if you've ever had one of those experiences where you finally show up to like the right specialist's office or the right doctor's office and their intake forms are like, you can basically check every box. It feels so good. Um, I remember I texted a friend that that day, cause that was, I did the sleep apnea study the same day that I went and did my tongue tie assessment where I got diagnosed with tongue tie. And then I went to the sleep study and they said, I probably have sleep apnea. And I remember I told a friend like, I just got, got diagnosed with two different conditions today, even though I wasn't technically diagnosed with sleep apnea that day. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm so sorry, Lil. <laughs> I was like, why are you so, like, I'm excited. This means I can do something about it. Like, this is a pathway for me to understand what's going on with me. Um, it was like, just a revelation that there could be somebody out there who can help me. So yeah, I, I, I want to like flip that script around what it means to have a diagnosis. For me, it was empowering. It was okay. Now I know, like now I have the awareness of where I should be directing my focus in to actually have somebody say, well, this is something that we can measure and that you're experiencing it's helpful to have that piece of the picture. It's not the whole picture, um, but it's a piece of the picture. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to get that. So I filled out the forms. I met with their doctor. I talked to her a little bit. Um, and she said she suspects that I have both kinds of sleep apnea and that they wanted to do a test. And one thing that's important, my um, orofacial myofunctional therapist mentioned that they wanted to make sure that I was getting blood oxygen measured, which this clinic did measure that. I don't know if that's standard, but um, I had my blood oxygen measured while I was sleeping as well. And that was, so part of the reason I wanted to do the sleep study when I did it, when I started um, my tongue tie therapy was because I wanted a baseline before I changed my airway. I wanted to know what was going on in the beginning of it. So now I have those metrics and basically, you know, I, I qualified for having a sleep study. They said, if we think you have one, you should come back and sleep in the clinic and we'll measure you. And they called me and um, they give you three different options, or at least they did for me. And it was 7.30, like eight o'clock and nine o'clock. 
And I thought, who the heck can fall asleep at 7.30 in the afternoon? I mean, that's the afternoon to me. So I did the nine o'clock because I never fall asleep before 10. And you go in and it's, you know, dark and you're like kind of wearing your pajamas and like showing up at this doctor's office in the evening. And it's like a little motel a little bit. Like the, the patient rooms all have queen size beds and TVs in them and like little dressers and nightstands. And you go into one of the rooms and like you get ready for bed basically. And then they set you up. It takes about 30 minutes to like put the electrodes and all the different measuring devices on you. And then you lay in the bed and then they turn off the lights and there's a video camera and like a two way intercom in the room. So you're being watched while you sleep. You're being measured and recorded while you sleep. It's a weird experience. I just will put it out there. It's weird. As a kid, I was like all excited to do it. And I, I had this moment of like realizing my childhood dream when I was driving there in the evening of like, oh my God, I'm driving to a sleep study in the middle of the night. I've always imagined doing that, like since my dad had his sleep study. Um, but it wasn't this like great, like dreamy childhood thing of like my fantasy. It was kind of weird. I loved my sleep technician. I will say that that was really crucial that my sleep technician was super nice, super comfortable with him. He was just really personable, um, made me feel really um, secure and just at ease. He was, felt very competent. Um, yeah, that was great. I hope you get a good sleep technician if you do this because like they're watching you sleep. Their job is to sit there and watch you sleep and, and monitor you and make sure that it's like you kick off uh, an electrode in the middle of the night because they're like around your feet and stuff too that they'll come in and actually like reattach them. So it's it's a little bit weird knowing that like somebody could come in at any moment to your room or that if you talk, they'll hear you. It, it's, it's just, it was kind of like mentally weird for me to get into that space to sleep. That's basically how it works. So then once you do the sleep study, they call you with your results. And I've heard from different people who have done sleep studies that the clinic themselves will sometimes say you don't have sleep apnea or you don't have issues sleeping. But if you take it to another kind of specialist, like an airway specialist, maybe they'll look at your results and say, well, yeah, you do have issues sleeping. So the threshold for them to diagnose you with sleep apnea is pretty high from my very basic understanding. I'm not a sleep technician. I don't totally know these things, but that's what I've heard from talking to several different people who are professionals in the industry. So my results, my sleep study results. Um, I have sleep apnea. I have a mild sleep apnea, according to them. I have both kinds of sleep apnea, the obstructive kind where you physically have an issue getting air, like your, your, my tongue drops back or something and like blocks my airway. And I also have the brain kind that's not the term for it. I don't remember the term for it. The kind where you're, um, you actually stop sending a signal to your body from your brain to breathe. So I have both and my blood oxygen dropped to as low as 83%, which when the person on the phone was talking to me, she was like, dang, that's low. <laughs> like, wow, you look at these all day long. I trust your opinion. Dang, that's low. Um, so yeah, I have sleep apnea. I would have never thought I have sleep apnea. I don't really snore. I I mean, I wake up, I feel normal, but I always nap. I'm, I'm usually really tired and I have a very hard time concentrating. So I'm hoping, um, they so they recommend that you come back after that and they do another sleep study where they fit a CPAP machine to you and they like test and calibrate them. Um, I told them that I'm doing surgery on my airway, which is the tongue tie release, and that um, I asked, like, should I get fitted now or should I wait until after? And they said, oh, if you're doing surgery, that's great. But, like, they never even told me that that was really an option from the sleep clinic. Um, I don't think they would recommend that for mild cases necessarily. Um, so it was kind of strange to me of like the fact that I, I was coming into the sleep study with armed with my own knowledge, armed with my own understanding of what could be contributing to it. Nobody there mentioned about tongue tie. My sleep technician had never even really heard of it in adults. Um, that's how like different these worlds are that, um, I somehow found out that there was a connection 
but people working in the sleep clinic didn't even know that tongue tie could necessarily be connected. And when I started telling my sleep technician about tongue tie and my symptoms and what was going on, he goes, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So it, it's really interesting to me the way that, you know, you can be in the clinic, you can be working with the people and they can totally overlook certain areas of your health because it's not necessarily directly in their specialty. So for me, that's been why it's so important to be researching online, be watching other people's stories, because you can pick up these little bits of information of like, wait, that's connected? Oh, I should be looking into that. Like, for example, I had no idea that my pelvic health could be so connected to my mouth health and that there's like these connected muscles that I'm, you know, if I'm doing myofascial release on my jaw to prep for the tongue release, that like it's releasing things like my psoas, which my psoas is like in incredibly tight. So now I have a, ref I called my primary care provider and I said, Hey, can I have a referral to a pelvic floor ther um, physical therapist? And she said, sure. Are you incontinent? And I said, no, but I have these other symptoms. And she said, okay, great. I'm mailing over a referral right now. So, <laughs> and I had already done the research and said, this is the pelvic floor therapist I want to work with. And I already called that office and I asked them when their next available appointments were. And I found the office in Chico that could get me in the soonest. So there is an art to getting care from the medical establishment. And I feel like I'm just starting to learn how to navigate and really um, work the system in a way that works for me. And it it's feeling really important for my health that I actually have that access and that knowledge. And I know that that can be a huge barrier for people. Um, so I'm feeling grateful, definitely, that I'm able to spend hours on the phone researching, calling people, figuring out what needs to do, what happens. You know, I have spent like four hours on the phone with my insurance this week already. But <sighs> yeah, so I, I got diagnosed with sleep apnea and, you know, I'm, I just found out yesterday, I haven't even talked to my oral facial myofunctional therapist about it, but my plan basically is that instead of doing the CPAP machine where I go back in and get the study and get fitted for a machine, I'm going to do the airway, um, surgery, the tongue tie release and continue with oral facial myofunctional therapy, which is like physical therapy for my mouth. And they, the person on the phone at the sleep clinic said, if you do surgery, we usually wait four to six months after that for you to kind of adjust your sleep back after the surgery before we have you come in again. So I'll go in again, probably four to six months after, probably four, after my surgery and get another sleep study and see if things have changed. Um, one thing I'm really curious about is if my blood oxygen changes, if I get more oxygen um, through sleeping at night. One other thing that um, is something that I had no idea about sleep, I had no idea this could be so important, is um, taping your mouth. One sec. Taping. Just like a mind-blowing practice that I never knew. Here's some tape. This is a lot of tape. I usually like fold down the end so there's like a tab I can grab. Putting your lips inside. This is how I've been sleeping now. And I've been sleeping so much better. My orofacial myofunctional therapist, Brooke, told me about this. And it's just totally changed my sleep. I sleep so much better. I'm breathing out of my nose and I can't open my mouth. Um, and something about that has just totally helped me. And she said specifically, don't tape when you do the, the sleep study. You know, I want to see your blood oxygen levels normal. So I'm wondering if after I do the tongue tie and after I do the, the myofunctional therapy, if I'm getting a mouth seal at night and I'm breathing out of my nose my entire night, if that in itself will help me um, increase my blood oxygen levels. 
So we'll find out later. I'll do another video. So that's my story. That's how I came to understand that sleep apnea might be affecting my health, you know, how it all began, what I did, the steps I took. So I'm really grateful that I've been able to find a team of people, um, both in my personal life and medically to support this journey that I'm on. And yeah, it's just really, really important that we all feel healthy and well. So yeah, if if you're wondering what you can do about it, um, I'd say the first step is to contact your primary care provider and to request a sleep study and then do the sleep study and see where that lands you. If you come back without um, having, like, you don't qualify for sleep apnea, like you didn't um, get a diagnosis and you still think, well, I think I have something going on, I would recommend talking to a, um, a DDS or an ENT, like a, a a, do a dentist or an ear, nose, and throat specialist that has experience working with airway issues. There's um, an institute called the Breathe Institute and Dr. Zoggi that are kind of the leading airway specialists in the United States. He's down in LA. They have a great website. They have tons of information online. Um, I think they have programs around um, dealing with sleep apnea and airway. So I would definitely recommend looking at their online resources. They probably have a, a lot of resources about what you can do. Um, trying the mouth taping can be really helpful. Um, and finding basically somebody who will support you and help you on this journey and believe you and not gaslight you and just like get you the resources that you need to get assessed and hopefully get better. So yeah. Again, thank you for watching my videos. This has been week five of my tongue tied journey. You can like and subscribe and comment. I'll get back to the comments. I read all of them and, um, and see you next week.